Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses, and in this video we'll be addressing the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ Before Pilate, the Crucifixion, and the Empty Tomb. Taken from the Student's Monthly Letter by Badley P. Hall, January 1938. The Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26 verses 36 through 57 describes the ordeal of Gethsemane. In no part of the New Testament is it more clearly indicated that Jesus did not regard himself as identical with God the Father. The identity of the three persons of the Trinity was determined by a series of church councils which had little regard for the letter of the Gospels. The prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane is given in Matthew 26:39. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. From these words it is clearly revealed that Jesus did not possess power over the Father, or power with the Father, but rather besought the Father for mercy. Here also Jesus resists his destiny, but finally acknowledges the supremacy of the Father's will. Matthew 26:42. Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. According to the old doctrines of the Gnostics, Jesus was overshadowed by the Messiah or Sotar. When the ministry was finished, the Sotar retired into the higher eons and left Jesus to suffer and die alone. They gave us this as the true interpretation of the words of Jesus upon the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27:46. Muhammad whose contact with Christianity was through Nestorian monks in the Arabian deserts had definite opinions of the fate of Jesus. They devised a stratagem against him but God devised a stratagem against them and God is the best deviser of stratagems. In another place the prophet of Israel says, The malice of Jesus' enemies aspersed his reputation and conspired against his life but their intention only was guilty, a phantom or criminal was submitted on the cross, and the innocent Jesus was translated into the seventh heaven. Quran 153 verse 53 and 104 verse 156. The Egyptian Basilids, a disciple of Matthias, says that Peter told him that Sarinthius was crucified in the place of Christ, that Christ himself did not die but ascended to the higher eons. It is evident that the last days of Jesus are a great mystery. The Manichaeans and other initiated sects of the Near East insist that a sublime secret is concealed within the account of the Passion. Indeed, as St. Paul has said, the crucifixion is a stumbling block. Paul could not know that this stumbling block would remain to the 20th century. Christ Before Pilate the earliest reference to Jesus in secular history occurs in Pliny's famous letter to Trajan and in the annals of Tacitus. Both works belonging to the 2nd century AD Our present descriptions of Jesus are derived principally from works attributed to Pontius Pilate and Publiusa Lentulusa. Both of these descriptions are regarded as comparatively late forgeries, probably originating between the 11th and 4th centuries. Pontius Pilate appears to have been the procreator of Judea from AD 27 to AD 37. The Roman officials kept a complete record of the various cases which appeared before them. There is no entry that can be regarded as coinciding with the one given in the Gospels. The Roman law in Judea was very exact in the matter of penalties for various crimes and misdemeanors. Crucifixion was reserved for criminals of great physical violence, such as highway robbery and murder. The penalties for civil offenses and religious misdemeanors was death by stoning or the sword. In the Archiepiscopal Palace at Bourges was long preserved the pretended order for the execution of Jesus. It read as follows, Jesus of Nazareth, of the Jewish tribe of Judah convicted of imposture and rebellion against the divine authorities of Tiberius Augusta, Empire of the Romans, having for this sacrilege been condemned to die on the cross by sentence of the judge, Pontius Pilate, 
on the prosecution of our Lord Herod, Lieutenant of the Empire of Judea, shall be taken tomorrow morning, the 23rd day of the odds of March, to the usual place of punishment under the escort of a company of the Praetorian Guard. The so-called King of the Jews shall be taken out by the Strumman Gate. All the public officers and the subjects of the Empire are directed to lend their aid to the execution of this sentence. Signed, Capel, Jerusalem, the 23rd day of the Ides of March, year of Rome, 783. According to this document, the crucifixion occurred in the year A.D. 30. If, as Eusebius states, the ministry of Jesus lasted nearly four years, the ministry began A.D. 26. All of this is very confusing and leads to the inevitable conclusion that the entire subject has been obscured by misunderstanding and imposure. There is also a great controversy over the character of Pilate. According to Philo and Josephus, Pilate was a man of violent and obstinate disposition who terrorized the countryside and sought above all other things to destroy the laws and privileges of the Jews. He promoted civil strife. His spies were constantly bringing in reports of treason, and he was in every way contrary to the Pilate of the Gospels, who is depicted as a gentle soul of compassionate nature who washed his hands of the entire matter. In metaphysical symbolism, Christ before Pilate signifies the conflict between spiritual and temporal power. It signifies also that the temporal has dominion over the spiritual in the physical world, but that the spiritual rises triumphantly over the material in the superphysical world. Strangely enough, Pilate sees no wrong in the man and returns him to the Jews. That is, Jesus is finally condemned by ecclesiastical law. This is strangely reminiscent of religion as a whole. It is not the materialist, but the theologian who destroys his own faith. Crucifixion. There is a rare manuscript of the Apostle Barnabas, which was for some time in the possession of Cramer, in which it is definitely stated that Christ was not crucified. He was carried into the third heaven by four angels, Gabriel, Michael, Raphael, and Uriel. Judas died in his place. It is impossible at this late time to determine with certainty how much of the gospel story is to be accepted literally and how much is to be understood as mystery in the spirit. We must remind all sincere Bible students to the words of Senecius, Bishop of Alexandria. Therefore, as a bishop of the church, I will continue to disseminate the fables of the church, but in my private capacity I shall remain a philosopher to the end. It was the honest conviction of the Parthristic Fathers that the deeper mysteries of the Christian dispensation were beyond the understanding of the laity. In order, therefore, not to cast pearls before swine, they devised a cycle of fables which have come to be accepted as the literal historical facts. From various causes, the same general condition has arisen in most religions. Spiritual matters cannot be understood by those not spiritually enlightened. Again, enlightenment cannot be bestowed, it must be evolved. To be serviceable, a religion must be comprehensive to the mass of its followers. The result is inevitably a compromise with truth. In serving the uninformed many, theology leaves the enlightened few without adequate spiritual food. Jacobus de Virajnia, in his Golden Legend, compiled the extravagant legends of medieval theology. His monumental work, loaded with absurdity and superstition, became a textbook for the pious who doubted not one jot or tittle of it. It is exceedingly difficult, critically and yet sympathetically, to discover the golden thread of truth in the tangled skeins of tradition. There is no virtue in perpetuating the false, nor is there any virtue in disregarding entirely that which may contain vital and significant truth. We must search for meaning, but we must not manufacture meaning. We must desire to discern the mystery, but our desire must not be the parent of false interpretation. The crucifixion of Christ is the real foundation of Christianity. Christ was the first martyr of the church, and by his death bestowed performance upon the teachings of his disciples. 
the crucifixion is the blood atonement. Theologians insist that the blood of Christ spilled upon Golgotha purifies all who believe on him and by a unique virtue cleanses all men of original sin. That is indeed a strange foundation for a faith and is peculiar to Christendom alone of all great religions. Gradually the cross has come to be regarded as the proper symbol of Christ and the crucifix a constant reminder of what Christians like to call the drama of the ages. Yet frankly and honestly this entire belief and all the consequences that have been built upon it have been footed on the most insecure foundation. There is no absolute proof the crucifixion did not take place, nor is there any absolute proof that it did take place. The principal and almost sole foundation of the crucifixion account are in the Gospels and the immense literature derived from the Gospels. It follows therefore that until the Gospels themselves are authenticated and their true authorship determined, no account peculiar to them can be regarded as historically established, nor do we desire to be regarded as merely quibbling, making much out of little. The truth is there is less actually known historically about the founding of Christianity than any other great historical event in the last 3,000 years. That the Gospels contain at least mistaken information is now proven beyond doubt and it is impossible to state with certainty where such errors end. For 2,000 years the New Testament has been taken on faith and upon the principal convictions of individuals not in a position to prove what they believe. No one will deny the sincerity and devotion of these hundreds of millions who have accepted Christianity. Nor is it of great spiritual significance whether their belief is based upon fact or fable if they have lived well and have been introduced into courses of tolerance, honesty, gentleness, and wisdom. All other factors are of secondary importance. When history impinges upon the mortal life, however, has been in the matter of tolerance. It is the tolerance aspect which makes facts necessary. I think most will agree that the Christian church has not had a distinguished record for tolerance. Intolerance is based upon a small certainty about things unknown, yet intolerance can be the destroyer of religions and nations. Hence for the necessity for the statement of doubt and the modernization of theological enthusiasm. An explanation of the crucifixion from a philosophical standpoint inclines the mind towards the belief the account is allegorical rather than literal. At least the significance is allegorical. The crucifixion myth occurs too frequently in history of ancient religions. We become convinced that it has some esoteric significance. We are certainly spiritually enriched by such a conclusion. We transform history into living facts when we perceive eternal truths shadowed forth through presumably historical circumstances. The crucifixion is believed to have taken place on a small hill outside of Jerusalem, now called Gordon's Calvary. The rock formations on the side of the hill cause it to resemble a great skull, thus explaining the name of Calvary or Golgotha, both of which refer to a skull. Jerusalem is what is called a walking city. That is, it gradually has changed location over a long period of time. Its present boundaries were not those of 2,000 years ago. According to the Roman Church, the original site of Calvary is enclosed within the area of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The presumed location of the original cross is marked by a gold ornament sat in the floor. A short distance off on each side are two inlays, one of black and one of white. These mark the places where stood the crosses of the two thieves, the white inlay signifying the repentant thief. According to the Gospel account, Jesus was crucified directly over the burial place of Adam. This is mystically set forth on certain crucifixions by the addition of a small skull and crossbones near the foot of the cross. After Noah had removed the body of Adam from the ark, he buried it on Golgotha. Accounts like this contribute to the realization that we are dealing with spiritual allegories rather than historical facts. Christ was fastened to the cross by three nails, the feet being crossed. The Kabbalists explain that the fourth nail of the crucifixion was stolen by a magician. The three remaining nails survive in symbolism to this day as the British mark of the broad arrow. 
there has been a definite schism in the Christian church over the problem of whether or not there should be three or four nails. The crucifixion depicts the Messiah, the guiltless one, dying between two thieves who were not nailed to their crosses but were tied thereon by ropes. When the mother of Constantine claimed to have found the true cross with its nails, the Emperor Constantine used one of them as a bit for his horse. A second nail is believed to have been melted into the crown of Hungary, the famous Iron Crown. This is most extraordinary in so much as nails were not known in Syria at the time, and if spikes of any kind were used, they must have been wooden pegs. Why is the crucifixion present in more than a dozen ancient religions? Why was Prometheus crucified on Mount Caucasus? with a vulture gnawing at his liver, and Christ on Mount Calvary with the spear of Longinus thrust into his right side. Prometheus brought the fire of God, wisdom to men, Christ brought light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The mystery is explained when we understand the words attributed to St. Paul, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and the mystical theosophy of the Gnostics and other early Christian sects. It was taught that mind consisted of two parts by nature, called by the Platonist intelligible and intelligence, and by modern philosophers abstract and concrete thought. The Orientals teach that the two parts of the mind are symbolized by the two lobes of the brain. Abstract and concrete mind are the two themes, just as in Demas. Christ as pure knowledge or truth is, therefore, represented as crucified in equilibrium between the two extremities of thought. This further points up the teaching of Pythagoras that virtue is always in moderation or in a middle distance between extremities. The lower mind does not repent, but the higher mind becomes aware of truth, is promised by the Messiah that it shall be with him in paradise. The natural function of the mind is the estimation of phenomena. The mind looking outward through the brain observes and contemplates the mysteries of the physical universe or of the body. The lower mind is the instrument of habit, appetite, emotion, sensation, and self-preservation. The higher mind accepts to itself philosophy, religion, and the arts, and contemplates the more refined elements of material existence. It is the higher mind which by discipline can be lifted up into a recognition of divine truth. Mind can never grasp reality, but it can recognize dimly the significance of reality. Truth can never be reduced to thought, but thought may contemplate truth from afar, honoring even though understanding is impossible. If by Christ, then we represent truth which is the firstborn of reality the eternal messiah, the universal savior, we have perceived the substance beyond the shadow. As long as we are satisfied with a merely literal explanation, pinning our hope on salvation upon the historical circumstance, we have not gone far in the understanding of spiritual mysteries. Truth manifesting the material universe is hopelessly obscured by the inadequate vehicles of its manifestation. Perfection, manifesting through the imperfect, appears by very necessity to be imperfect itself. Wisdom is exploited into scheming, thought is misused, the energies of life are dissipated, and the divine plan is indeed crucified in man and in nature. The finest part of life is reduced to servitude to the material and man. A son of the infinite dedicates himself only to the finite. Yet this truth, which is crushed to the earth in the life of each person, does not utterly die. Like a seed planted in the earth, it remains dead until aspiration brings it to life. The true resurrection is the lifting up of truth in the individual, the resurrection of the eternal in the temporal, the resurrection of the virtue always latent in man. This latent power manifests forth in all its glory when study and experience have released the individual from bondage to appetite and desire. The Empty Tomb In the 20th chapter of John is described the visit of Mary Magdalene to the tomb of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea, 
besought Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus and prepare it for burial. It was this same Joseph, according to the Glastonbury legend, who later traveled across Europe, bearing with him the wreath of thorns. Reaching England, Joseph of Arimathea built the Abbey of Glastonbury and planted the reed of thrones which took root and became the celebrated Glastonbury thorns. He is believed also to have carried with him the Holy Grail, and in the past several years, excavations have been carried on at Glastonbury in the hope that the cup might be rediscovered. According to the Gospel account, Mary Magdalene found the empty tomb and the great stone rolled away. From this occurrence, the story of the Holy Sepulchre had its origin. The supposed tomb of Christ now stands in the center of a great rotunda in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The tomb itself is a small cube-like room ornately decorated with the tributes of 15 centuries. The sarcophagus itself runs along one wall of the crypt, resembling a low stone bench. In the middle of the crypt is the stone upon which the angel sat, at least so the gods tell us. For centuries, the Holy Sepulchre was in the hands of Islam, and Christians were forbidden the right of pilgrimage. The result was the Crusades, in which the knights and nobles of the kingdoms and principalities of Europe went forth against the Saracens to wrest the tomb of the Lord from the hands of the infidel. The truth of the matter was that Europe was gradually emerging from a feudal state to a national existence. Feudal lords and robber barons fought against the nationalization of countries. Therefore, by cunningly devised stratagem, these lusty warriors were indeed to undertake crusades in Palestine. Many of them died at the siege of Acre. Sickness and time took the lives of others, and those who did return discovered that during their absence, their powers and privileges had been removed and Europe had emerged from feudalism into the beginnings of constitutional governments. In Freemasonry, the Knights Templars, or York Rite, are still defenders of the Holy Sepulchre, but the literalism of the medieval world has passed. Mysticism has given a new meaning to the old quest. It is now realized that the Holy Sepulchre is not truly in Jerusalem, but is the very body of man himself. It is within this body which Plato calls the Holy Sepulchre of the Soul, that the divine man lays buried. It is also from this mortal fabric, as from a tomb, that the immortal man rises up and releases itself, as in the mystery of the resurrection. It is now the duty of each man to roll away the stone, that is, to illuminate himself to rescue his own higher nature from bondage to animal appetites and desire. The resurrection myth is common to all great religious systems. It is an essential part of religious idealism and derives its authority from the highest and most sublime initiation rites of Greece, India, and Egypt. The Crusades served a most valuable purpose in addition to disrupting the feudal system. Europe became for the first time aware that civilization extended beyond the boundaries of Christendom. The returning knights described the glory and honor of the Saracen. They had found Islam as not a fire-belching dragon, but a world of culture, literature, art, and science. They had found Saladin not only the empire of the East, but a wise and generous foe. Many of the nobles brought back with them wives from among the Saracens. This fact is preserved in the heraldry of Europe by the addition of a lunar crescent to the arms of a noble family. With the returning crusaders, science returned to Europe. So dangerous did this knowledge become to the preferment of European politics that the Knights Templars were slaughtered. Jacques de Molay burned at the stake the lands of the Templars confiscated and themselves accused of practicing heretical rites. But all things worked together for good. The search for the Holy Sepulchre resulted in the resurrection of Europe. Sincerely yours, Manly P. Hall. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description below. Thank you very much.